we're here at Flint Rock Farm, uh, right in the center, pretty much, of the 37th district in Elizabeth Township. And I am joined with the owners of the farm, Dan and Jen Heller. So thank you so much for opening up your beautiful property and allowing us to take a peek at it. Absolutely. Sure, thanks for coming. Yeah, we, uh, we, I said, people drive past your farm all the time. It's just gorgeous. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, behind us is the stone uh, barn that I know there's great history for you here, Dan. Your grandfather bought the property in the 1940s. Uh, and, and did you grow up here? I actually did. I was actually raised on this farm. Uh, this is the home farm, the home Heller farm. Uh, my grandfather lived here for many years. As you said, he bought it in the, the 1940s, lived here many years, and then uh, my family lived here many years, and I was actually born and raised in this farm, so it holds a significant value from that aspect, and, and uh, there is there is a lot of history here. Uh, this stone barn behind us was actually built in 1816, so it's really cool and fitting that we uh, kind of have a celebration of uh, some of the history this say, year because absolutely. it's actually it's 200, 200 years uh, old. annual anniversary. Anniversary uh, this year, so it's it's got a birthday party coming up. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. So um, when he, your grandfather, bought the farm, it was mainly a dairy farm, correct? correct? Yep, that's correct. And when I was younger, it was a small dairy operation. Uh, I remember milking the cows when I was a, a, a kid, and it was a great introduction to agriculture. And uh, had that um, small, typical Lancaster farming, uh, Lancaster County uh, dairy operation here on this farm. Great. And then your father, was there Was there other siblings there? Uh, yes, I have a brother and a sister as well, an older brother and a sister. So my brother and I uh, and, and another gentleman actually got into the poultry business uh, while I was in college. Okay, and, hold on, back up for yep. me a second though. But first your father bought it, the farm, right? Right, yes, yeah. And. And then he, did he expand or did he just keep dairy? He, he actually had dairy for a number of years and then uh, actually sold the dairy, got to a point where it, it was either, uh, you know, you expand uh, to keep up and make significant in investment into uh, taking it to the next level in the dairy industry or look at other farming alternatives. Uh, he was also a pastor as well, so uh, he was uh, bivocational um, and was doing that as well. And so. Um, at one point in time, um, he had uh, some beef cattle after the dairy, um, so we had uh, a number of different things on the farm over the years, um, did the crop farming, um, and then he actually uh, got into the poultry industry uh, when Tyson was going through an expansion, I guess in the early 90s, uh, built a couple of poultry houses. Um, and so that's kind of what gave us our introduction to the poultry industry as well. Nice. Now, now tell me about your generation. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's now uh, continued on the succession planning, um, and uh, I'll be uh, the third generation that's farming this farm uh, in the Heller family. Um, my brother was involved with the partnership for a while um, and is no longer uh, is involved in other businesses now. But uh, so it's our family, and we have four boys, uh, ages 14 down to uh, age six. Uh, um, so, so you have more in the works. We have, uh, <laughs> we have a whole other generation that's having the opportunity to uh, uh, be able to participate in farming in Lancaster County, and, and it's truly a blessing. That's great. And, and your background, you sit on a, a number of different boards. Yeah. So tell me about that. Yeah, certainly passionate about uh, agriculture in Lancaster County. It is a unique uh, place in the world. Um, it has uh, a, a lot of unique aspects um, to Lancaster County agriculture. Um, it's a thriving and very diverse um, industry here in this area. Um, a lot of people don't recognize uh, the significance of it uh, in terms of national reputation, um, what it means in terms of agricultural production, uh, certainly a leader in many, many different uh, fields uh, and segments of the ag industry, whether it be agricultural production uh, or whether it be environmental uh, stewardship, things that are being done here um, that are very unique and inventive and innovative. Um, a lot of those sorts of things. Uh, agriculture in Lancaster County is a billion dollar industry. Um, and uh, I, I've sat on the uh, Lancaster County Ag Council as one of the groups that I've been involved with. And uh, we've done some, some research and some work trying to quantify uh, a bit more of what the agriculture sector means to this region, to our local economy, to jobs, uh, the spin-off impacts of that. 
And so we've been able to uh, articulate some of those impacts um, and recognize the fact that it actually has a, uh, about a six to seven times multiplier. So uh, that billion dollars of agriculture activity and farm gate receipts actually turns into about a six billion dollar impact on our local and regional economy, um, which is a significant, as you know, impact. It's big. On it our, is. On it our is. Our we are blessed here in Lancaster we County. Are. Yep. But. Uh, one of the other things that we are talking about so much in Harrisburg is um, is EPA coming down yeah. with DEP right. for the Chesapeake. And we're going to get into a lot of that uh, when we go up to the chicken farm so you can tell us all your best management practices. But you also, are you still on the conservation board? I am, yep. Okay, so I know those folks are very involved and we'll be able to chat a little bit about that. Yep, absolutely. We were blessed to have a, a fantastic conservation district here in Lancaster County we as sure well. Are. Absolutely. We sure are. Jen, what's your background? Did you grow up on a farm? I did not grow up on a farm, actually. However, I had a father that was involved with um, ag nutrition, so uh, he was visiting a lot of farms, and I got to ride along to farms as a child, so <laughs> <laughs> had a little bit of experience there. So is it everything you imagined? <laughs> Living is. on a farm? <laughs> it is everything I imagined. It's a lot yeah. of hard work, but it's a lot of fun as well. It's wonderful. And then when you're out here on a day like this, you just soak it all That's in. It's sure. just beautiful. incredible. <laughs> yep, it is beautiful. Sure. All right. Well, we're going to go see some different parts of your business. We're going to head down and we're going to watch them uh, do some of the lessons with the riders and, and talk about the things that happened here. But uh, it's neat. So I appreciate you inviting us Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming. coming. You bet. Thanks. <laughs> So here we are in the pasture and going on behind us is, is some lessons, some horse riding lessons, which uh, Flint Rock uh, participates with. So tell the viewers a little bit about, uh, about what happens behind us. Okay, so we have a lesson program here at the farm and uh, we offer um, lessons and offer teaching good horsemanship uh, to the rider in a safe environment, which is obviously very important. Uh, we, uh, uh, we offer lessons from the beginner, a um, lesson that has never even stepped foot in a barn before. We've had three-year-olds come in here. Oh my, I was going to say, what <laughs> age? Three? We, oh we, my we goodness. Three, we have a three to six tiny tot lesson, <laughs> um, but you know, you have to be into it and, and ready. It's a 30 minute uh, short lesson, oh, uh, but we neat. start from the, from the little guys up until, you know, the adult um, advanced riders. So. And here you actually have some horses that, that they can take lessons on or Correct. people can bring in their own horses, right? Correct. Either way. We have our own uh, team of horses here that we offer for lessons, so you only need to come with boots. Uh, we have helmets and the gear and everything else um, for you. You okay. just come in, in pants and boots and you're ready to go. So what's an average young person, if they want to be involved, like how often do they take lessons? What is, what's typical and what do they do with them? Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So typically there is a weekly lesson. Um, some kids do more than that. You know, we have some kids that are, that are once you start to compete, you'll start to take more lessons. Um, so to get ready for competition. Um, but usually it's a, a weekly lesson. We offer packages of lessons. We offer individual lessons to, um, to our customers as well. So I can bring over my five-year-old granddaughter Absolutely. for a first start. <laughs> I was going to say she'd love it. Every now and then we do a birthday party too. Oh, so really? Okay. <laughs> okay. So when they go to compete, let's mm -hmm. talk about the competition arena a little bit. Where, where are they held? And let people who have no idea out there about the horse uh, world, where, what's that like? So at Flint Rock, there's a lot of different shows that are um, available. At Flint Rock, our um, focus is mainly on fun shows. So there's rated shows as well, which mm -hmm. we get to as we increase in, in, in knowledge and ability. But we do a lot of fun shows here as we have a lot of um, youth riding lessons. And also our adults are, are interested in the fun shows, which are not rated and are simply that. They're a good learning experience with um, low pressure. And, oh, that's um, great, though. So, yeah. So, yeah, they... They are competing or against each other, but it's in a, a good environment that um, just promotes friendly competition. <laughs> and Dan, talk a little bit about the type of riding that's going on. Sure. Us. Uh, so this is uh, mostly hunter jumper lessons. Uh, we also have uh, uh, some other folks that are doing uh, more dressage focus uh, training and lessons. But this is uh, um, hunter jumper lessons that you're seeing behind us. Um, we. Uh, also have a 4-H program. I was going to say, yeah, the here. conservation yeah, district <laughs> so, uh, that is wonderful. Yep, uh, through Penn State. Penn State, Penn State uh, Extension does a great job at supporting uh, a 4-H program, which really helps foster 
growth and education in young people about agricultural related activities, one of those being equestrian and equine. Uh, so they're learning uh, from a young age how to take care of a horse, how to uh, care for a horse properly, as well as uh, competing and that sort of thing. So, in fact, um, this weekend we have our 4-H district show in which we're taking three of our students up to Dillsburg to compete with the whole district of 4-H members that you, you have to qualify. You have a fun show first and then a county show, which is a quali qualifying mm -hmm. show. And now this weekend will be the district show, which leads to the state show. I was going to say, absolutely. <laughs> the farm show complex. Sure, sure. And what a great week that always is up at the farm absolutely. show. Yeah. <laughs> So it's a, it's a, that's been a great program to allow kids to uh, learn about horses. Uh, they meet here once a month at Flint Rock, uh, a, a smaller club, but uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of kids that come out to that and uh, learn about horsemanship, uh, what's involved with that, all the different aspects, whether it be vet care, uh, shoeing horses, um, uh, all the different uh, care aspects and, and educational uh, forms that they can uh, participate in um, for learning horsemanship. So, And we certainly program. focus on building character as well as um, part of the 4-H focus is engaging mm -hmm. kids to their fullest potential. So that's definitely um, something we aim to do at Absolutely. At it's, it's great stuff. Let me ask you something. I always talk about um, jobs and careers and and is there a lack of veterinarians and people in this industry or, or is there not? That's a good question. Uh, agriculture in general is going to continue to have a, a high need for jobs in, in this region and in Lancaster County. Um, there is a, continues to be a, a lot of growth. As you know, the ag industry is, is very large here, a sure. uh, very healthy industry um, that is very diverse. Uh, so you have all different segments of the ag industry, uh, from dairy to uh, poultry to horses. Um, there's, it's a very diverse industry. So there are a lot of different job opportunities, and, and a lot of those job opportunities don't get a lot of uh, exposure right. and, and PR, but they are very good jobs. Um, and, and like you mentioned, veterinary is just one of those jobs. I, I, I'm not intimately familiar with the uh, kind of pipeline of workers for the veterinary uh, aspect of mm -hmm. things, but I believe there is a shortage, particularly in large animal vets, mm -hmm. uh, from what I understand That's what that I've there's, heard. yep, mm -hmm. that there's a, there's a real shortage of people going into that. Um, and so it's a great opportunity for someone who has an interest in that sort of thing. Well, and that's why our 4-H programs are so great. You know what I mean? To, right. Uh, right. to help them from young on to learn what all careers and opportunities are out there. Yep, it allows them to develop an interest and a little bit of knowledge about what might be involved with those career opportunities down the road. Sure. I know you gave us the history, but the horses weren't always part of the farm, as no, you explained absolutely. earlier. So, so what made your desire to uh, to get involved with the horses here at Flint Rock? Sure. Well, we, we are a diversified farming operation, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we have a desire to uh, uh, participate in our community, uh, to be a, a, an asset to our community, mm -hmm. and this allows us to interact with our community and allow people to come out and enjoy the farm, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, doing a, a pleasure uh, horseback uh, session or uh, whether it be competing and, and preparing for competition in horses. Um, we had some barns here that, that we wanted to put to good use um, and it was a good fit with some other things that we had already on our farm and uh, we're, we're doing. So um, as, a, as a diversified uh, farming operation, this just seemed to be a good fit for good us. Good fit. It's great. So very briefly, we're going to head down and talk to Brendan next right. and just explain uh, the, the two different umbrellas here at sure. Flint Rock. Sure. So we, we have a, a relationship with uh, uh, Curtis Dressage, uh, Brendan Curtis, um, who does uh, kind of focuses on the uh, dressage aspect of of, uh, horse training. Um, so he does a lot of training and uh, instruction in that arena um, and so that allows us to um, uh, be able to offer uh, top-notch dressage um, training and lessons here in this region as well. Um, he's been in the business for uh, quite a few years and has done a fantastic job at uh, bringing a lot of young horses on and, uh, and competing um, in all aspects of uh, dressage related training. Perfect, perfect. Well, I'm going to head down there next. Excellent. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks. Now we're down in the stables and uh, we're with, oh my word, a beautiful horse named Sir. We have Brendan with us and Megan also, and they are the trainers, the head trainer here at uh, Flint Rock Stables. So tell us a little bit about a typical day. What goes on in your world here? 
Um, a lot. <laughs> um, so a typical day for us, we usually get down to the barn, you know, first thing in the morning. And again, our focus is on the training and development of mostly younger horses. Um, Sir, for example, is four. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, and he was actually, he was bred in Southern Lancaster County by a lady named Leslie Feekins. And um, we've kind of been involved in his life since he was a year old. Um, showing him that there's a prestigious breed show um, over in the Malvern area called Dressage at Devon okay. um, that he participated in as a yearling, two-year-old, and, and three-year-old before he was even started under saddle. When you said you work with younger horses, what's the uh, lifespan? Oh, look, <laughs> look in your ear. What's the uh, average lifespan of a horse and, and whether they compete and train um, to compete? So for, I mean, like on international levels, they'll compete until they're 18. Um, okay. And then the average life, I mean, average easily into their mid to late 20s. Um, not uncommon to be into their mid 30s. Um, and I think the older horses on record have been over 40. Oh my goodness, but so. they start at four but years old or younger? Usually we start them under tack, when the, under saddle, uh, when they're about three and a half years old. And so, and we start the like groundwork training and enhanced stuff when they're, basically when they're born. Okay, so tell a little bit about, about um, the type of riding you do and you train. Yeah, sure. So we, we train horses for a discipline called dressage, which basically means training. Um, a lot of folks equate it to horse ballet. Okay. where basically we train for a competition um, where we perform a prescribed set of movements and each movement is judged on a scale of one to ten. Um, I think at the Olympic level there are 45 movements roughly in the tests that are judged in that way. To, and the people, the, you, younger or older or who comes in to participate to get trained? Um, for, the for us the majority of our business has been not older but we'll say more middle-aged. More middle aged. Yes, middle aged. We do have a, a young rider program, you know, kind of both nationally and, and we do work with some younger kids, but um, the majority of our business is adults. Okay, so they're adults. So do they then compete, right? Yep. And, okay. and are they from this area? Are they from Lancaster or do you draw from, you know, all central PA or even outside of that? Um, we do both. We have horses from, like, his owner is actually from Ohio. Um, so we co own the horse, actually, you know, have a partnership on him to okay. develop him. Um, we have several local, you know, residents in Lidditz and Lancaster and, you know, from the area. Um, where else do we have folks from? Um, we, have, we have clients in North Carolina, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of, kind of up and down the East Coast. Coast. Okay, yeah. so they all come mm -hmm. and they all, do they own their own horses or they can use horses that are here? They all own their own horses. They all yeah. own yeah. their all, own all horses. All the horses that, are, that, we are, that we have are owned by an individual. We don't, we don't offer school type okay. situation okay so so one of the big pushes of course is up at the state house right now that we're working on is pennsylvania bred horses and i know you said sir was from southern lancaster county but obviously you know if you're training people from all over mm -hmm. the horses are also from all over how is pennsylvania bred horses compared to other states um <laughs> to be honest i've had a lot of good luck with pennsylvania bred horses and Pen either pennsylvania bred or pennsylvania owned um, we, there was actually, we did an article a couple years ago going back to Dressage at Devon, which is the most prestigious breed show of its type in the world. Um, and the top three horses were actually from Lancaster County. Oh, you're that, kidding. That place, two of them, Boy, two of them were wonderful. bred here and one of them was then imported and then, yeah, he's a goofball, um, <laughs> oh imported gosh. and then owned. Um, so th there's a lot, there, there's a lot of really good quality, uh, you know, on, on the dressage end of things. You know, in this area. <laughs> sure wants to get on. Uh, he has a lot to say also. Yes. So let's talk about the care of the horses here. Sure. So you use local veterinarians. We do. Yeah. He's a local practice. Uh, yeah. Jeff Edelson um, is over in Mannheim. Sure. And, um, and then we have, I use a lady for sports medicine uh, type stuff from over in Chester County. Uh, okay. Hope Bachelor. Yeah. And they have to be shooed, right? Yep. It's, and how often does that happen? And what's the process of that? Taking care Usually of horses. Usually takes um, about... Every four to six weeks, they get shod. Okay. Yeah. I think we, we have our horses on a, on a five-week yeah. five week rotation. And Megan, you do something very special with the horses. I do. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. I do um, equine massage and body work. Um, so how I describe it to people is just, they're just athletes, just like a, fo a professional football player it would be. So they need all the extra support that they can for their body to perform at the best they can. So. I do that um, on our horses as well as other farms. 
oh, all yeah. over the country. Yeah. That's wonderful. Because you, you travel quite a bit too. Do you? Go to, okay. Yeah, go to Texas, go to Florida, go to. Yeah. So you you travel the states. Oh well, I think it's incredible. But I want to thank you very much for uh, sharing with what you do. Let the folks in the 37th district know what's happening here. Uh, but uh, we appreciate it. And sir, I thank you very Good. much for participating. What a beautiful, beautiful horse you are. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for stopping by. Sure. Thanks. Here we are at really the heart of your business. This is probably 80, 90% of, of your business, the poultry side of it. And uh, if you notice our, our lovely boots, mm -hmm. we are here and uh, you follow all biosecurity measures. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. That has to do with the avian flu. Um, but you have, you, have, you have hen houses here and you also have them down in Maryland and Delaware. So, so give us a rundown of, of what is here. Sure. Well, um, these are uh, all uh, meat birds. They're called broilers. Um, so uh, we have uh, uh, some of them in the background that you can see uh, coming out on this beautiful day uh, and enjoying the beautiful sunny weather here. Uh, absolutely. Um, and, and this is a bit unique compared to some of the other uh, chicken houses that you might see in the, in the county and in the region in that these are organic, uh, organically certified chicken houses. So all the birds that you see behind us are organic chickens that will go to the grocery store as uh, organic chicken. Um, Go you ahead. know, I, w I was up in New York City and my, my uncle has a family member that owns a restaurant up there. So I was visiting the restaurant and, and he's giving me the tour and behind the scenes. And he said, oh, he said, we get the most wonderful organic chickens from Lancaster County. So yep. truly, I mean, these guys go everywhere, correct? Yep. There is a tremendous amount of uh, organic production that happens here locally. We contract with uh, Coleman Natural Foods, which is a division of Purdue. Most people have heard of Purdue Chicken. And so they get labeled under Coleman Natural. You can find them here in Lancaster at Costco uh, under Coleman Natural uh, Foods. Um, but yeah, we are really known in this region as being almost a mecca of organic production. Um, in the Northeast here, there is a lot of agriculture, um, organic production and dairy and poultry. Uh, Dr. Patterson at Penn State uh, here was recently sharing some statistics about the organic production and uh, truly uh, people look from other regions of the country to us here in this region as uh, being a hot spot for organic production. That's fantastic. When the birds come in, how old are they? We get the birds at one day of age. Wow. So they're little peeps uh, just hatched out of the egg, uh, only one day uh, oh, wow. of age and just weighing a few ounces. Um, and then we uh, feed them here and try to keep them uh, healthy and, and happy. Um, and uh, then send them out at about seven weeks of age. And they're seven about weeks. six and a half pounds uh, uh, as, as about the weight at that age. Are the peeps locally? Are they? They are. They come from, uh, a lot of them come from Lebanon County. Okay. Yep. So there's a hatchery up there that hatches them and, and uh, they bring them down here. Great, great. Well, and this is what you went into from the dairy farm to poultry, and this is really what the business is all about. Uh, right. Yep. A couple of years ago, uh, you know, agriculture continues to evolve, and, and in agriculture, as with a lot of businesses, you have to continue to adapt and change. And so we are certainly a diversified farming operation, but we uh, used to raise conventional birds, and a few years ago, we did. De determined to move towards the organic production, um, which is why you see some of the porch roofs back here and the doors and the windows in the houses. Um, so there's a, a much higher standard that you have to meet if you're going to uh, raise birds organically. They get organic feed. Uh, the corn that's fed to the birds is all grown organically uh, with no pesticides. Um, and so the birds can't get medications, that sort of thing. So there is really, a, it's a truly a, almost a different ball game in terms of raising organic chicken versus conventional. Well, and not only organic, Dan and Jen, but you two are true leaders in, in the environmental side. Um, I know you won numerous awards. You won from the Lancaster Chamber uh, last year and earlier and for the things that you do here on the farm. And I have to tell you, uh, another very, very hot topic uh, up in Harrisburg is the Chesapeake Bay and cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay. And we're talking about ag and the ag industries and best management practices. And you are a pillar of best management practices that happen here on the farm. Let's talk a little bit about that. Sure, well, we, we uh, certainly believe in it. It's part of our ethic to uh, steward well the environment. We believe uh, you know God's given us this creation to steward. And so we wanna do our part in stewarding that um, responsibility well. Um, and so we, we try to 
employ different practices that are being proactive um, and, and stewarding the environment well. Um, I think at the end of the day, you know, we all want clean water. We sure do. Um, and, you know, in the past, some people have made decisions and choices that sometimes have hampered clean water. And so we certainly want to get to a point where we're, we're all enjoying clean water. And, uh, and farming has made tremendous strides in its practices and, and how they approach soil conservation. Uh, having sat on the, uh, having, uh, sitting on the soil conservation district, I get to see all of these additional practices that farmers are employing uh, every year that are being more and more proactive and raising the bar in terms of utilizing new technologies and new practices. Give us a, give us three of those sure. that you have done here. Um, sure. Well, some of those uh, that we've done here are uh, stormwater management. On this farm, we've done some unique stormwater management uh, uh, practices. We actually have five different basins, so we're trying to take all the water that comes off of these roofs mm -hmm. and collect it into basins and then percolate it down into the earth rather than having it run off and go to a stream and, and ultimately get uh, into the Chesapeake Bay sure. quickly. And take the soil with it. Right. With and all take the, the nutrients soil. and all yep. the phosphates right yep. along with it. Right? Absolutely. We're, we're trying to infiltrate more of the water on site. Uh, the earth works as a natural percolation mm -hmm. um, to filter out any impurities that might be in the rain and so it's a great way to recharge our groundwater resource. Most people don't think of farms in terms of uh, facilitating their groundwater or drinking water but really farms are a huge uh, resource to be able to uh, produce uh, drinking water for its citizens because it, it's all these large parcels of land that are percolating that water down in and providing drinking water for people. That's great. Um, and and what about the waste? The, yes, the, the waste. Yeah, the gasifier. One of one of the new technologies that we've employed here through, in conjunction with a number of uh, environmental uh, organizations and and. Uh, uh, foundations is uh, utilizing a waste to energy project. So um, it, it's called a process called gasification. So we're taking the waste that comes out of our poultry houses, the, the animal manures, mm -hmm. and we're running that through a gasification um, system. And it's a, a thermal conversion uh, process that uh, basically uh, heats the litter up uh, and, and incinerates the litter. And then uh, the, the gases that are driven off from that incineration are then reignited. And those gases produce a heat. That, that ignition of those gases produces a heat that we then uh, harness that heat uh, through hot water and we take it back and actually heat our poultry houses here. Mm, so we're taking a waste product and, and turning it into an energy product uh, and, and actually heating our, our poultry houses with the waste product. We also get a, an ash product that comes out the back end which is a very condensed, highly uh, uh, a condensed nutrient that is great for land applications in areas that really need that and that's one of the challenges. There are parts of uh, our region and our country that really need those nutrients sure. but we have a lot of them in this area in the southeast, southeast uh, portion of Pennsylvania so we're able to then transport them. We've transported loads out to Missouri for example okay. where they have just loved this product because it provides a, a very rich nutrient that's easy to transport um, and, it, and it's uh, efficient to transport so that's worked out well. Well, we appreciate it. I mean, it is a major topic up at the Capitol, and, and, you know, I sum it up with this. I know EPA comes down to DEP that comes down to the local farmer. Um, I want clean water to drink. We all do, right? But I also want to be able to eat, so I want to make sure our farmers can afford to farm. Yep. And uh, so best management practices put in place are critical, and you certainly do your part here, and, yep. and I appreciate that. Yep, we do no-till practices. We've done some other creative things with uh, solar here as well. So we're, we're actually, this particular farm is actually uh, very green-minded because we're producing uh, the energy that we use for, to cool the birds uh, with the solar that's coming off from the sun. And then we're using in the winter time. We're using our waste product to heat the the birds. So uh, we have a very uh, efficient uh, sure energy uh, farm here, and it's it's a very uh, green-minded farm. Uh, we've done a number of projects with Penn State and others about putting different uh, trees up. We have over uh, 1,100 trees that we've planted around the farm uh, to help uh, with air quality and that sort of thing. Provide a, a better, better uh, environment for the neighbors and those surrounding our farm. Mm. Um, we've done uh, different types of grass plantings to test which ones can uh, help filter air right outside of a, a fan in a poultry house. 
Um, so we've done a lot of projects with Penn State and others. Oh, well, I, I love it that you're on the cutting edge and that you're here in the 37th district. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you thank so you. much for allowing us to come onto your farm. And uh, I appreciate you joining us for another legislative update. You can always reach me. I have the office in Mannheim and the office up in Denver. You can follow me on Facebook and um, sign up for the weekly uh, email updates because I want you to know what's happening locally in the 37th district and also what's happening up in Harrisburg. Thanks for joining us.